Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Kelly Writers House. Um, thank you all so, so much uh, for being here. I'm thrilled that you guys um, were all able to come out at a Monday lunchtime event. I'm super grateful to you all for coming out. Um, I think that the reason why many of you are here is because is the reason that I'm here, which is that Amit Jodhri is sitting here, which is very, very exciting for us here at Penn. Um, I, I want to read you his little bio, but mostly I want to tell you that when uh, Kelly Writer's House um, approached me and said, Amit Jodhri might be interested in coming to Penn, like, you know, what do you think of that? I was like, what do I think of that? What do you mean, what do I think of that? I mean, tell him to arrive immediately, please. Um, and so, um, so, and this, this is part of the reason why. Um, Amit Jodhri is the author of eight novels, including most recently Sojourn, which I believe is what he's going to be reading to us from today. Among his other published works are collections of short stories, poetry, and essays, as well as uh, nonfiction Calcutta, a critical study of D. H. Lawrence's poetry, um, and a work of memoir and criticism about Indian classical music, Finding the Raga. Um, he has also received numerous prizes and awards, um, which I won't list for you, but you can absolutely go and take a look at how many prizes and awards he has won, including, and this is the one I really want to mention, literally just last week, Finding the Raga won the James Tate Black Prize, which is the UK's oldest running uh, literary prize, super, super super exciting uh, for us to have him here. We thankfully booked him on his world tour b b before uh, all this excitement was happening in his life. Um, and so uh, we're super, super, super grateful uh, that he's here today. I have a thousand questions for him, um, and I'm super excited to talk to him about his work. But, uh, but before we get into all of that, I believe Amit will read to us a little bit from Sojourn. So thank you, Amit, and welcome. Thank you, Pierre Lee. Thank you so much for that. Um, really generous introduction. Um, yeah, I, I've, I forgot my uh, copy of, of the book. I thought I would kind of decide on the train which bit I I would read, but you know, I've I kind of left it till about ten minutes ago. So, um, so I'm just going to read something which I selected at random. I'm, it's such a short book that anything I read will comprise about a quarter of the book. Um, so, uh, so this is what's going to happen here. But before I start reading, um, maybe I should just set the context for the, you know, tell you what the book is about. Although, uh, yeah. People say that my books aren't about anything, but I don't. I don't agree. They are. They are about <laughs> about something. So, uh, so, so you know, um, uh, the this book is is about a, a an academic who uh, from India, although that 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 detail isn't that important. Um, uh, who who arrives in uh, Berlin in two thousand and five? Um, I suppose the kind of memory of the 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 wall having come down is still is still alive at that time um and you know he he arrives and he becomes very quickly sort of not just taken with the city but absorbed in his encounters with the city uh, and this begins to happen right from the outset um so this absorption kind of takes the form of of immersion in in what he sees for me the immersion and absorption become interchangeable with a sort of loss of oneself in the object of of absorption so you know as, as as you say when you get absorbed you know you you lose yourself in something this this i kind of maybe take as a trope in the in the novel and i i kind of literalize it in the sense that the man is losing his memory <coughs> gradually or losing his sense of where he's from but it doesn't bother him because he's absorbed by having almost encountered something that seems familiar and home-like to him. So there's this other question. Why does he feel a sense of arrival having arrived in this foreign city, which he's not really doesn't know he hasn't been in before? And there the kind of subtext is the fact of uh, having been at home by when I say our, I mean people from my generation and earlier generations uh, have been formed by and 
been at home in a kind of historical epoch uh, and ethos which many of you would not have experienced, which is the, war, uh, the, the, the time of the Cold, Cold War. Um, Cold War kind of slightly misrepresents the, the fact that the world was divided between the Soviet Union, America, and everything that fell in between. And certainly in India, you know, um, India was a non-aligned nation, and it, it kind of professed loyalty neither to the Soviet Union nor the, 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 the United <coughs> States, but was supposed to be tilted, that was the word, towards the Soviet Union. Um, that is sympathetic to it. And um, so I I India itself followed a kind of you know, economic model partly to do with a contained, free mar contained market and uh, um, socialism. So um, that created a sense of who you were. And, and, and you kind of would encounter variations of these sort of continuums as you, as you went to different parts of the world. So the fact that we are only shaped by nation identity uh, doesn't take into account how this particular balance that was formed during the uh, uh, that existed during the time of the so-called Cold War, also formed the spaces in which we lived how we, and how we lived in them. Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say is that his sense of homecoming comes from the fact that something returns to him about the world in which he grew up in and which was destroyed with the, with the collapse of the, with the demolition of the Berlin Wall which led to the creation of a new world in which a lot of people felt, with, even if they weren't aware of it, lost and without direction. So enough of the background, which, as in my case, kind of often, you know, what I write about my books kind of exceeds in word count the books themselves. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so uh, he has arrived, and we are now looking at maybe his second or third morning he, um, well, let me begin with the first evening itself, or the second evening, where he's giving a reading and then he is um, approached by a man who then promises to take him uh, to see sights in Berlin. And th there will be two of these people in the, in, the, in the novel as he also begins to gradually lose uh, his memory. At the end of the talk, four or five people came to speak with me, and he elbowed his way through with the air of someone who realizes his train has arrived, apologetic, cheerful, pleased with himself. Hello, he said. I heard a Bengali accent. He, he continued in Bengali. Ami, Arki, uh, that is, I recorded your talk, but I wanted to ask you some questions. Can I see you tomorrow? I studied him, dazzled. I am from Deutsche Welle. I didn't know what Deutsche Welle was, but my contact gave it a gravitas conferring nod. I relented. When and where? I didn't want to sound desperate, but I had few responsibilities. I will call you, he said, without explaining how he had come by my number. He bent forward to give me his card. Fakrul, my name, he said. On the card was Fakrul Haq. Deutsche Welle was in italics. The next morning I had a dark bread I'd never had before with coffee. I buttered it and ate it, untoasted. The flat was new to me. I'd moved into it the day before yesterday in a hurry. It wasn't the flat I'd arrived into. That was smaller, a kind of studio. The drawing room and bedroom merged with the kitchen. In another mood I would have found it charming. The first evening, though, I was depressed, especially by the lack of demarcation between shower and toilet. The bathroom was narrow. On another day, I would have warmed to this. Which space do you own more entirely than the bathroom? But that evening, I stepped out of the shower and saw the toilet was wet. I called Jonas. 
I hope everything is all right, he said. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Thank you. There's one thing. Please don't hesitate to tell me. I tried to remember. Isn't it true? Actually, I have the letter before me. Isn't it true that the Biol professor gets a two-bedroom flat? I could hear Jonas taking this in. I'd only entered the flat an hour ago. I'd embraced it inwardly. I'd taken to its 20th century quality, but then rapidly began to feel doubtful to reconcile what I'd been asked to expect to where I'd been deposit, deposited by Jonas. Yes, the bold professor gets a two-bedroom flat. That is right. But this is a one-bed, I think, or a studio. A silence. Yes, yes, I see. Yes, I think... They thought that since you don't have your family with you, you won't need a regular flat. Yes, I understand. The bathroom here is very small, Jonas. It's not what I expected. I said, knowing he'd now dislike me. I can't be here for four months. I think I should get the flat I was promised. I'd rather go back if you can't. No, 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 no. I already had a sense that Jonas was courteous and unexcitable. He allowed himself a moment of urgency. I will call Max right away. Max, who had invited me, was on sabbatical in Arizona. Thank you, Jonas. I moved the next morning. The Burl professor's apartment was only two houses away. The me here is not me. I mean, it's the character. I, I haven't lost my memory. Uh, so, anyway, um, it was spacious with wooden floorboards, an expansive drawing room with a TV near the window. The small bedroom had a bunk bed, presumably for children. I never went there. My room had a king-sized bed, unlikely to be put to full use. To not have a family felt like a windfall. The kitchen was to the left of the hall leading to the front door. There was, a, there was surplus space here too. I registered this as I buttered my bread the first morning. The bathroom was almost miraculous. It was wide but long with a bath and shower. As in a golf course, you felt that there was always more to come. The toilet was a conundrum. I'd never seen anything like it except in the studio flat. It was mostly a slab, like a dissection table. I decided to acclim acclimatize myself, but I couldn't bear to sit on it for very long. It stained easily because of the shape, and I started cleaning it as soon as I began using it. I wondered if it was part of an industrial heritage. Using the toilet, my first thought was, Oe must have sat here. He couldn't have escaped it, and I felt a kind of empathy and embarrassment thinking of Kenzaburo Oe in this bathroom, seated where I was, of him then going out to the drawing room. Oe had won the Nobel Prize, but this is what it comes back to, a relief at amenities. Jonas had told me that Oe had occupied the flat in the late 90s before it began to be assigned to build visiting professors. He had spent... Six months in Berlin at the invitation of the German Academic Exchange Service. I had read one OA novel, by chance recently. It was about a man and his brain-damaged son, a seemingly insentient being who is also a living conscience. It had been mentioned by a relative who himself was terribly bereaved. His son had killed himself. OA's novel was, I heard, drawn from life. All this, the relative, OA's <coughs> suffering my bum touching the seat that always had rested on, was on my mind in my first days in the flat. The cell phone rang in the morning, rang late in the morning. Hello, said the voice. Hello, I said. It was like an old-fashioned trunk call. Hello, Camo Nacho. I, I was wrapped for a second. For cruel Arki. I'd forgotten our conversation. I'd forgotten about the talk last night. We said we'd meet today. The reluctance in my silence may have been audible. He was a man who expected reluctance. He had a bridegroom's thick skin. I was thinking of getting some work done. What is it that you'd like to do? Oh, nothing at all. An interview for Deutsche Welle? What else? We will have lunch. I will introduce you to a fantastic place. I will show you two or three fantastic places, but we can start today. My suspicion increased. Fantastic place meaning? Yeah, he brushed me off. You wait and see. I'll tell you how to get there. He said I should walk to Oscar Helena Heim and take the Uban to Gorlitzer Bahnhof. I made him spell the name, but the way he sa said it, Gorlitzer Bahnhof, had me guessing. He was clearly a local, a Bengali local. Gorlitzer Bahnhof is old. I don't mean that it's getting on in years. I mean it's familiar. 
Just as when you say he's an old friend of mine, you're talking not about the friend's age, but that he's been your friend for a long time. Gurlitsa Banha felt known to me. It was my second visit to. It was my second time in Berlin. I had little memory of the first visit. I should add that the U-Bahn is misleadingly named. It's hardly an underground line. Much of it floats over the city. Görlitz Bahnhof is itself elevated. As I came down the stairs, I saw a man in an ash-colored plastic jacket smoking furiously. I'd spoke. I'd forgotten what Fakru looked like, but he smiled at me, and I smiled back distantly. He had the huddled look of a man who likes snatching time to himself. Be careful, they're all pickpockets, he said. Africans had been waiting for me to descend. Esho, he said, navigating. He was shorter and older than me. He wore thick glasses and had a moustache. He was strong. We, were, we crossed the road. I wondered what we'd eat. He had a preemptive air of someone who knew who, of someone who not only knew me for years but could predict my questions. After seven or eight minutes, we came to an Indian restaurant. We went up the steps and entered a large yellow space. It had a luncher, an old man. Fakrul introduced me to a plump young man. Here's the person I was telling you about. The plump man ushered me in the way a prince of a small state might show the dignity of major nation his modest palace. Pakoras and Mango Lassi arrived. Should we do the interview now or later? asked Fakrul. Thak, let's eat first. Yes, we can do it later if we don't fall asleep after the meal. Fakrul's compact being shook with laughter. The plump proprietor asked pointedly, Tandur pran khaiben? I don't like prawns in Indian restaurants in Europe because they're frozen, but they were his most prized gift. And I nodded. I admit I was a bit disappointed. I didn't expect to be having Indian food in Berlin on my fourth day. I asked, Have you heard of Himalaya Imbis? Himalaya Imbis. Fakrul had a deep voice suited for radio. A friend mentioned it. A friend? Acha. I was thinking of Odhir Roy, a sociologist and misfit. He'd been here in 1987. When I told him I was off to Berlin, he'd gone into a reverie. You must go to Himalaya Imbis, he said. It's a small place. Very nice. You can get curry there. I'd sit there for hours. His name's Odhir Roy. Odhir Roy. Fakrul frowned with the authority of one who's on first name terms with everyone worth knowing in Calcutta, though he hadn't visited it in 40 years. No, don't know him, he said. Then he addressed the proprietor who happened to be passing. Afzal, do you know Himalaya Imbis? Himalaya said Afzal with a practiced blankness. In my head, Himalaya Imbis had become the only place in West Berlin in 1987 that served Indian food. It came back to me that Odhir Roy hadn't lived in Berlin in 1987, but 1989. But any history before November 1989 was so continuous that Odhir could be embedded in it at any point. That was eternity, with its Himalaya embassies never to pass. Odhir was a film fanatic. He'd come to Berlin to pursue Alexander Kluger, both the man and his work. He told me that he'd been to dinner with a left green group the day before the peop the day before people were given license to clamber over the wall. None of us knew, he said, that it would end. When it did end the next day, it felt inevitable. There was a wave of food, chicken bhuna, dal, pulao rice, tandoori prawns. Soon I'd found I'd find I'd found <laughs> sorry. Soon I'd find find out that lunch was gratis. Fakrul, I didn't know it then, was a well-known exile. He was a poet, booted out of Bangladesh in 1975 for insulting the Prophet Muhammad in a poem. Buoyed by blasphemy, he'd gone to a careless extreme. His imagery was catalogical. He found refuge in Calcutta. There he became a literary scene regular. Then the West Bengal government, belatedly nervous or realizing the poem had denigrated every known deity, reconsidered his domicile. Around this time, Gunter Grass was in Calcutta discovering, Columbus-like, its garbage heaps and poor. He hung out with 
writers heard of Fakrul's tenuous situation. He must have liked him because he began making arrangements for Fakrul to get asylum. Fakrul emigrated to Germany in 1977. I wasn't nonplussed by the waving of the bill, as I knew of the generosity of the Bangladeshis. I didn't know then that Fakrul, despite his beliefs or lack of them, despite the infamy that had descended on him in 1975 or because of it, was held in awe by proprietors of Indian restaurants across Berlin, all God-fearing Bangladeshis. They periodically served lavish meals free to Fakrul and his distinguished visitors, among whom I supposed I was included. After lunch, Fakrul held a large microphone while I spoke about modernity's advent in the world, the subject of my last book and the next one. Outside the sky was pale. This is Kreuzberg, Fakrul announced. That way no man's land, he said, wheeling around for a second. We resumed walking, staying parallel to the overhead bridge of Görlitzer Bahnhof. I stopped to study a Mercedes-Benz. It was a model I'd seen and even got into as a child, a 250. It, it looked unaffected by the seasons. Behind it was a small car. The excitement of confronting something you don't know is very like the excitement of recognizing something you were familiar with long ago. What is this? I asked. It was new to me and incredibly old. Fakrul tried reading its name, but I think he was bluffing when he said, it's an East German model. There was a hint of pleasure in his words. It could have been a Soviet make. Self-sufficient, redundant. Come, said Fakrul, beckoning. He'd stopped before a board. It had flyers on it. See, he said. I flinched. It was a photograph of a nude woman. I flinched not because it was obscene. But what did he have in mind? Was this an avuncular initiation? The photo was black and white. The woman's outlines, breasts, shoulders, were rounded, soft. It was from 1923. I could guess at enough of the text to understand it, it announced an exhibition of erotic pictures from the time. See, said Fakrul, I paused at the eyebrows, pale nipples and navel. 1923 meant nothing. The woman was in a now, and all else was irrelevant. And this one, he said, pointing to another poster. Off theatre, something out of the way. I didn't know what the poster said. I imagined what off theatre implied. This board, he said, gesturing with a hand, is for off theatre. Thank you. That's half of the book. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly isn't. But um, thank you so much for that reading uh, from Sojourn. And I want—I have a bunch of questions that I want to talk to you about regarding Sojourn specifically. Um, but I don't think I could start any conversation with you without acknowledging uh, to, to you as well as to many of my students who are in the audience that this is my middle school copy of Freedom Song. Um, it is uh, one of Amit's earlier works and uh, one of the very, very first South Asian names I ever saw on a bookshelf at my local Barnes & Noble when I was growing up in New York. Um, and so I pulled it off the shelf without really knowing what it was and um, read it. I, I don't know how much I got from it when I was... I don't know how, how old I was at the time, but it was in middle school. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then really it was only when I read it again after college um, that, that I realized how much it had already been in my brain uh, for a long time. And so, um, so I, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. Um, and I also wanted to, I, 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 wa I want our conversation to go in all those directions, but I actually thought that the place where we could start um, our conversation um, uh, as, as a beginning uh, to the reason uh, why Amit has been such an important figure, both to me but also to Indian English, to Indian writers in English, um, is uh, actually with a, a thought from Finding the Raga, which is uh, Amit's uh, memoir that came out last year, uh, which is entirely about his relationship with Indian classical music. Um, and so um, I, I was wondering, you know, all, all of these works have meant so much to me, but as a beginning, I was wondering if we could start 
with the idea of alap, um, which of course is the the uh, title of the first chapter in Finding the Raga, and it and it means um, an introduction to a piece of music. Um, and uh, you know, I, w I wanted to start there because um, Amit, you write in in all three of the creative writing genres. You write in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, which which essentially means that you're adept at three different art forms in, in addition to being adept in, in music. Um, and and you know. You, you sort of write all of these sometimes all at once. I mean, you guys will have heard in the reading, you know, uh, the chapters of this book in some ways read like prose poems. Um, and so, um, you know, for those of us who are students of Indian classical music, uh, one of the things that I was thinking uh, as I was sort of reading Sojourn is that alap is meant to be a really meandering thing. Um, it's meant to be an introduction to the work, um, but it's not, it's not hitting you in the face direct. It's a very um, sort of gentle introduction to what a piece of music is going to sound like very soon um, and what it does sound like now. Um, so with this idea of meandering and sound and prose poetry, um, to me, there's a connection there between uh, following the meandering shape of a thing um, and choosing to follow a thing in a particular genre. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the idea of genre and meandering um, and also the idea of the introduction to the reader to the page. Thank you. Um, right. Um, yeah. So just to sort of uh, go to the to the idea of alap introduction and then maybe make a connection with with a strange and sublime address which is the first of the three books collected yeah in that volume freedom song um and then yeah i'll try to sort of um respond to your question in that way so alap as as piali just mentioned means one of the one is one of its kind of principal meanings is introduction mm -hmm. so whether it's like alap between people uh, or, um, you know, whether uh, in 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 North Indian classical music, in in the in the uh, primarily in the genre called khayal, uh, the alap is this kind of section which leads to a uh, short exploration of the rag and then. In, in without any percussive accompaniment, without any tabla, and then the tabla begins in super slow time, in 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 khayal, especially as it came to exist in in the form it came to exist in after the 1940s. Um, so, and then the singer continues with the alap or, or the elaboration in free time while the while the tabla is keeping super slow time. And this, this section is called the Vilambit Khayal, and the Alap progresses. Vilambit means slow, so the slow Khayal. Khayal is Arabic for the imagination. It could be, uh, have other meanings as well. Um, thought, um, fancy. Um, so uh, the, the word is incorporated via Urdu into, into Indian classical music. Um, so, Let me just tell you very quickly what is happening in Alap. Um, so basically, a rag is a set of notes which moves up and down in a particular way. It's not a linear progression. So it's not like a scale. It doesn't go sare gama pa tani so do re mi fa so. It goes do, mi, re, you know, according to whatever that particular tune that's being slowed up and deconstructed sorry that's not a great word but it's the only word i can think uh, of what's going on over here the tune as is not kind of uh, done in any other musical tradition that i can think of is slowed down deconstructed in order to study its particular progressions the particular pro pro progressions that are peculiar to that tune uh, and the particular ways in which it goes up and down, the interrelationships of notes which are peculiar to that particular tune. And this investigation, and not just the tune itself, becomes the rag. 
this investigation of these the slowing down of the tune and the investigation into particular interrelationships and clusters of notes going up and down become the rag there may be two rags or three rags or four rags with identical notes but they each have different clusters going up and down the khayal moves from the lower tonic sa to the upper tonic sa widening further since the 1940s because of certain experiments with the form widening further this the space between notes and the way they travel towards each other so this is quite extraordinary what happens over there and the 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 the, the intention during this period of alap is to move from the lower tonic to the upper tonic but taking as much time as you want to and taking as much time to move between one set of notes to the next one as you want to um evading the not only the linear scale but evading even uh the expected movement within this cluster of notes so if i'm supposed to go in yaman from ni which is the let's say the lower seventh to re the the second note ni re ga re ga ma pa re sa come down again i know this doesn't mean anything to you but i would what i would do is ni dha ni ni re ni re so let's say i'm supposed to say ni re ga so instead of saying ni re ga i would say ni dha ni dha re ni re ni re ga i would then finally say ni re ga um i would defer saying ni re ga as 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 for as long as i can now even in the in the in the phrase ni re ga i'm avoiding sa which is the tonic so yaman could have been sa re ga the first three notes sa the tonic re the second the 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 natural second ga the natural third but that's not how it goes it it avoids the sa momentarily and goes ni the lower seventh re the second and the natural third ga so or even over there there's evasion evasion creates the form and deferral and evasion create expiration and all of this slow evasive beautiful set the this beautiful set of evasions moving upward towards the upper tonic and then coming down again is called the alap is called the introduction and one day i thought to myself bloody hell i mean you know which other <laughs> form of music gives so much privileges what's what they're calling the introduction the introduction should be over in 2 minutes indeed it is over in 2 minutes in the in the in the little introductory kind of introduction the introductory introduction that happens before the tabla begins to play but then once the tabla starts to play the, the introduction continues the alap continues and the alap becomes in fact the heart of the rag it becomes elaboration it becomes everything that the that the imagination is at play with so it's it's quite extraordinary because what the the musician is doing among other things is staying with continuous possibility staying in that realm not of development but of deferral of delay and of possibility which Stay- is a little bit what we ask the writer to do as well right which and is what it, uh, yeah the, the idea of possibility in creative writing right yeah. right and for me i mean um Yeah uh, so this kind of as I was thinking about it and maybe I was thinking about it in that particular way because I'd began thinking about what I write in a particular way and I was thinking yeah what really interests me as a reader are paragraphs and then I think about it what interests me about paragraphs are the opening paragraphs they inter- interest me the most and uh, the int- opening paragraphs interest me deeply because um is that a, it's not a time bomb or something no. is it okay uh, so um, uh, they, they 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 interest me greatly because um you know in in i find that the the opening pages of of a novel are for me the most alive in a sense because 
we are being introduced to a room, we are being introduced to a view from a window or a street, certain noises, a time of day, certain people, nothing is happening yet. And we have an encounter with something completely fresh and unresolved. And then this has to be then streamlined into what we call narrative, plot, and story. The person must begin doing something. And then, you know, what they begin to do must lead to something that has an impact on themselves, their family, and friends, etc. And that, for me, is terribly boring. You know, for me, this moment of encountering the, 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 the room the view from the window, the, the time of day, is what is amazing in terms of what writing can do. And so it seems to me, to me the conundrum is, the problem is, how does one then write a novel which has a narrative which is also composed of these opening paragraphs where you're encountering this sense of possibility and freshness again and again with each paragraph? And so in that sense, I suppose what I'm dealing with is also alap, exactly. the yeah. idea of stretching the idea of the first encounter, the introduction, infinitely. And there I see a connection with mu 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 Indian classical music. Um, so, yeah, uh, did, I, uh, did, I, uh, did I answer your question? Or did I go yeah. into it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, in, insofar as it, as it is an answerable question, yes. Yeah. I, I just, I actually was, was just listening while you were talking and making notes because I just wanted to underline for my students one, something that you said, which is that, you know, something that we talk about in class a lot, this idea of why are we doing creative writing? Why aren't we just writing a journalist art article? Why aren't we just giving the facts as they are? It's because that the sense of art and excitement is not created without this thing that Amit says, uh, e evasion and deferral. The, the entire thing is to evade the main point until it absolutely must be said. And that, that hope and, and hopefully you can pull it off so that you never actually have to come out and say it and so that, that you can kind of say everything around it so that the reader understands everything around it without ever being so on the nose hit you in the face direct as a plot line you know um, and so that is something that I feel like uh, particularly if you guys are interested Amit does a really beautiful job of describing uh, the the parallels uh, between Alap and Indian classical music and that sense of possibility that sense of constantly being introduced to the possibility of this world rather than constantly just being in the what happens next in the world uh, moment uh, in in his writing um, that's something that I just wanted to underline and uh, it's uh, I'm so glad you said this thing about opening paragraphs because I was actually Actually, um, my, my next sort of thought wa was connected to an interview that you recently did with Charles Bernstein, who, of course, was a pen professor for many, many years. Um, and he hosts a podcast called Pen Sound that is hosted right here by Penn CBCW. Um, and you mentioned in that in that podcast that when you're writing, you're, you're most interested in opening paragraphs and that maybe many paragraphs in the work should, uh, should act as, uh, if not opening paragraphs, and certainly paragraphs that can stand on their own. Again, we come back to this idea of the prose poem. Hmm. Um, and that, I think, um, that leads to questions of narrative and it leads to questions of, um, you know, you said yourself that your, your work is sometimes described as like nothing happens in the book, which, um, which is a, a, an astonishing uh, phrase to me. I, I always find that to be so shocking whenever I hear that because, of course, the idea of writing a book that's full of opening paragraphs and that's full of possibilities is that so much is happening in that book. Um, and so... I think one of, the, one of the reasons why I'm getting at this, one of the reasons why I'm getting at the idea of narrative and plotlessness, but possibility and openings, um, is that, is specifically because all of this complexity is sometimes referred to in your work as nothing happens in the story. Mm -hmm. And that to me is particularly shocking um, because I, I find that the nothing story is actually very often uh, a concept that is relegated to MFA writing, um, and particularly to American MFA program writing. And, and if you guys don't know what an MFA is, it's the Masters in Fine Arts. Um, it's where we are taught to write in some kind of a way. And, um, and sort of the, the American MFA model really, really privileges sort of the sentence and doesn't necessarily privilege uh, a plot line. But 
what that what that usually means is that in this construction, the nothing story is reserved for white writers who are observing the exquisite within the mundane of middle class white life. Um, this is where I want to sort of bring up my my deep and long connection to, to Freedom Song, um, which is a novel that uh, is set entirely in middle class Galgata. Um, and this novel, like many of your other works, is sometimes described as being plotless, but I think that the reason why it resonated so deeply for me in, in high school and beyond um, is because that it was using exactly those nothings, exactly those elements of introduction to a moment, introduction to a possibility, um, these sort of like moments of everyday Bengali life to refer to what you have termed to be sort of a new world order. Um, you know, you were talking about sort of like a post fall of the Berlin Wall world um, and the idea that many of us in this room, you know, that, that, that is a shift that um, has become imperceptible to us in, in today's world. But to me, the, what, what Freedom Song is doing, it's, it's such a clever way of underlining the insidiousness that has sort of always lurked behind constructions of the padro or the upper middle classes. Sort of every time I come back to that novel, I find something prescient in the way it describes um, a way of being that, uh, that middle class Bengali families certainly consider themselves to be above. They consider themselves to be above sort of um, the the unniceties of the world, let's put it that way. Um, but it's exactly in those moments that we find them sort of engaging in a sort of politics of intolerance, um, which is the kind of ruling and overwhelming global politics of today, and that's sort of what is brought out in Freedom Song over and over again, precisely by having a sort of plotless, uh, slightly focus on the the character of possibility every in, in every moment of, of sort of middle-class Bengali life. That's what's happening in, in that book. So this is all my very long way of saying. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it is, um, especially given that we are here at Penn, we have su such a diverse creative writing student body here. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it is to write the exquisite within the mundane of specifically South Asian life and why that is worth examining for you. Hmm. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I I was, I always intended to write poetry. I kind of uh, started writing a strange and sublime address, kind of, it was, uh, you know, it was an accident almost, you know, <laughs> that I ended up there. Um, I didn't realize I was doing anything unusual or that I was writing a plotless novel. Mm. Um, I, all I had in my head was that I would write about a holiday. Mm. And there, was a further, there, were, there were further tensions in my head mm. that I wanted to explore. Mm. Um, so one obvious one was that I would talk about a boy who would uh, uh, who would visit um, Calcutta from Bombay, mm. and and exchange the the kind of building in which he grew up in Bombay, on the what whatever the twenty fifth story or the twelfth story, for a uh, for a house uh, uh, during the, that period of vacation. Uh, which which was three stories high, and this this house would then uh, bring him closer to while still leaving him distanced from a a more populated experience of th of the street than was possible for him from the twenty fifth story. Um, so I w was kind of trying to sort of. Um, move away from the, the abstraction of that 25th story view and the abstraction of that life into something that uh, was kind of a life of, you know, where, where, you, where you experienced a house in a different way, but also the street in a particular way, but also the view of another house. Uh, and the, another balcony and what was happening behind that window, which you couldn't from the 25th story, at least not in the Bombay that I grew up in. So um, so uh, ramifying sort of realities. Mm. 
And uh, because also the, the 25th story or the 12th story meant that you heard less of what was around you, um, you know, you couldn't hear as clearly what was going on in the street or in the next street. Uh, in contrast to that, uh, from the third story in that house, you could see what and hear what was happening on the street. Uh, you could also s hear it when you weren't looking at it. Uh, that is, when you were inside doing something else, if the window was open as it always was, you could hear what was happening in the street without being aware exactly what, what was happening. But you could also sometimes be aware through sound of what was happening in a street you couldn't see. And and uh, and that kind of uh, was also of interest to me, or the you know the the possibility always of being touched by mm, the consciousness being disrupted and being touched by something that was invisible, that was not you know that that was known. So um, th these possibilities became available once the movement was made from the the twenty fifth story house uh, building to the apartment to uh, a three story. Um, house in Bhavanipur in in South Calcutta um, so um, I had always felt unhappy on some level in Bombay and uh, I think what I was kind of encountering in Calcutta as a child when these ramifying realities that I'm talking about comprised for me a way of being in what I call modernity and it was my encounter uh, with modernity that 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 I was trying to formulate mm. in that in that uh, in that book, which ca which I wrote at the end of the eighties, uh, between nineteen eighty six and nineteen uh, nineteen eighty eight, mm. and which finally came out in nineteen ninety one, um, and um, it, and the, so nineteen ninety one connected to this book. The the, the 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 Berlin Wall has fallen. Mm. So I, I my first book was published after the Berlin Wall had fallen. I knew I was writing about a modernity which was going, which was lost, um, and but I didn't want to elegize it. I had no intention of elegizing it or writing about it as a kind of recounting of of a childhood or a, a moment in the past. Uh, it was to be a moment in the present. The present was to be my subject matter. I wanted to write about the present moment. So there is no sense in the book that, you know, this is about a boy who used to go, blah, blah, blah. Mm. It's about the now. Mm. Yeah. So so here again, there another kind of tension was being explored. And, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s is when I, when I kind of grew up. And so, you know, the, the kind of the sort of ideas surrounding us especially when i was in uh, you know when i was uh, 17 16 years old uh, had you know if you were kind of slightly pretentiously intellectual that had to do with something co called existentialism you know the the word was there everywhere at that time existentialism and the other one was absurd you know, the, uh, the absurdist drama the absurd and mm, and then I l we we threw a lot of stuff into those categories so even if it was bergman we could existentialist <laughs> absurd you know and and then we would kind of uh, uh, congratulate ourselves on reading those books and watching those films and we would miss the humor and the sensuousness let's say of bergman you know that only because it's a form of not seeing of not engaging uh, um, so I, I would miss miss the kind of sense of life, let's say, in Camus or Sartre even, uh, because uh, you, the, once you go down that road, existentialism, this is what you're doing. Uh, you're cutting off certain things. Um, and and um, my intention with The Strange and Sublime Interest, with that book, was to, to write it in the now, to move away from the 25th story, to move into the street, to move outside of this internal consciousness. Mm. Uh, so... So the character must engage with what is happening on the street right now. Must engage. Yeah, must engage. Mm. And that's that's what's happening. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that kind of really intimate um observation and that kind of really intimate um it it I think it's uh, particularly interesting that you that you mentioned going from the the 25th floor to the to the first floor because of course that is that is what creates intimacy and it's these kind of like really tiny details that you wouldn't think you know we talk so much about setting and creative writing but like the setting on the first floor as opposed to the setting on the 25th floor creates an entirely different um 
mode of engagement for the character, right? And so um, that's that's so much of what I, I find in Amit's work in, in terms of this like exquisiteness of the mundane. Um, when you know, when I was just, sorry to interrupt you, just very quickly. I mean, when I began to write that book, I wrote a sort of credo uh, at the back of the of the journal in which I was writing the book, and I think I said something like, uh, "Whatever the imagination might." come up with it cannot be as multifarious as reality mm-hmm. so that you know so that was the mm-hmm. other thing and and without realizing it i was kind of diverging also from what would what was then emerging you know the idea of magic realism uh, inventiveness of a particular kind the idea of inventiveness being sort of synonymous with a particular sort of invention and and y- y- here i was kind of not aware that much of what was emerging in magic realism. Rushdie, of of course, had published his book already when I wrote that thing Mm -hmm. down. I wasn't acquainted with Mm -hmm. it. I'd heard of it. But I I suppose I was diverging from it, you Mm -hmm. know, by by writing down that credo, um, which, which meant, of course, that, yeah, it made life difficult for me as a writer. Well, it's yeah. it's a very difficult thing in fiction specifically, right? I mean, like even even without magical realism, the the idea that even when we're writing the real in fiction, it can never be, it can never contain the multitudes that real life contains. So we are constructing a realness mm. on the page in fiction in a way that um, certainly magical realism uh, allows us to open more doors. But um, but ev- but in any sort of like piece of fiction, you know, we we talk about this a lot. This idea that like when you're writing your story, um, even if it's based on a real thing, it has to be based on one part of that real thing because it can't be it can't be everything. It's 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 going to be too much for the reader in a way that when we live life in 3D, it's not too much for us to absorb all of it at once, um, which is which is uh, such a big part of that credo in some ways. Um, I have a, a, a thousand more questions about Sojourn specifically, but I also um, want to just make sure that, that we uh, have some time uh, for you guys uh, to, if you have any uh, specific questions that you want to ask Amit. Um, was there, were there any specific questions from the audience? Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a mic going around? Oh, perfect. Quick question, quick answer. Um, I don't understand uh, why a bridegroom is thick-skinned. Right. A lot of people have been flummoxed by this reference to the bridegroom. Yeah. Uh, I believe that the question is there's a reference in Sojourn uh, to, uh, to a bridegroom and that bridegroom is described as being thick skinned. Um, and the question is why? <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose it's my idiosyncratic sort of uh, understanding from uh, you know representation of bridegrooms in India uh, of 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 uh, the fact that a bridegroom needs to be slightly thick skinned because you know they're marrying often it, not often but sometimes uh, marrying each other without really knowing each other so the bridegroom steps in and then he's trying to woo his bride on the ma- wedding night <laughs> you know uh, and the, the and the bride re- rebuffs him so you have to have a thick skin to survive that. <laughs> so, so when I'm saying when I'm saying that this man is pursuing the narrator and saying, you know, come with me, let's go there, and and uh, jovially sort of waving away the resistance of the narrator, mm. uh, I'm I'm comparing it with this kind of um, thick-skinned, jovial person who in, enters the room and disturbs the bride, who happens to be the bridegroom. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Oh, there's a, there's a mic coming around. What was the catalyst or the inspiration for your character who has m- memory loss? Mm. Uh, um, so the, the catalyst was, as I said, this form of absorption. You know, the sense of homecoming, the, 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 the encounter with something which seems familiar and therefore like a memory, but so f- familiar, so absorbing that he loses his sense of himself as being, you know, I'm an Indian, I come from such and such a place. Um, He becomes not German, not a Berliner, and yet he feels more than other Germans and other Berliners that he knows the place. And, and, And this leads to something that I call he memory loss. It may not be memory loss. It may be just a kind of extinction of the kind of parameters with which we usually kind of construct these encounters. And an Indian in Berlin 
uh, the, the, the moment of absorption that we feel sometimes in cities or places which we don't know point to different things in our history which, then, which we have kind of submerged through these categories. I'm Indian. I grew up here. You know, those things don't completely account for who we are and why we respond to things like walks, um, streets, certain buildings, whether they're at home or in a foreign place. So, some places that are foreign will seem tedious, you know, like Dubai might seem tedious, but a certain area in Dubai might, might certain, suddenly open itself up to me. Why is that? Um, Dubai might seem more foreign or Atlanta City might seem more foreign to me than Berlin or certain areas in Geneva. Uh, just to say I'm Indian and I like this or that doesn't quite account for what has formed me and what is making me closed to certain experience, experiences and without my permission almost, opening me up to others. The, 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 this is the current of history in which we all are. And, and we, we can censor it. We can only behave like tourists when we go abroad. Or we can say that we feel at home at certain times and not at home at others in ways that can't be completely accounted for by our background or who we are. But that leads us to in, indeed to our background, in, in, but in ways we, in which we don't generally conceive of that background. We conceive of it in, in sort of predetermined ways. Hi, um, I have kind of a related question. So uh, in the beginning, when you first started describing the novel, um, you said that the main character is Indian, but you said that's not that important. So uh, I was wondering what exactly you meant by that, and what is the particular reason then that you made the main character South Asian? Um, I made the main character South Asian um, to locate him, to, to not sort of, um, to locate him. And, you know, it, the, the novel is connected to my experience of being in Berlin in 2005. But the person there is not me. It's, it's not entirely my experience. But it's the difference between the author and the narrator, which we talk about a lot. But, but at the same time, you know, I didn't want to make him, I, I saw no reason to make him English or, uh, or, 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 or American. If I had made him English or American or French, I would still make those identities redundant on, on some level, on some level, you know, important, but I wouldn't be writing a story about a Frenchman or an American in Berlin any more than I wanted to write a story about an Indian in Berlin. So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a point of, it's, it's, a, it's a fact in the book which, which kind of shimmers with contiguity as far as my own trip to Berlin was concerned. Uh, but the, the novel is not at all about trying to make sense of my trip to Berlin or, or my being an Indian in Berlin. Uh, that kind of narrative uh, was not kind of interesting to me. Mm -hmm. It was some other thing going on, which is also historical, but not in a way that that, that historicity would be curtailed if I made it about solely about an Indian encountering, the, encountering Berlin. Th that's exactly what kind of slips away in this encounter. But it, it is a historical encounter. I wonder, Amit, if, if another way of saying that is uh, the idea that uh, identity politics will only take us so far. Um, that, uh, that the idea that um, maybe uh, you're writing a book about an, an American visiting Spain, for a just random example, but, and you can, you can make that character just entirely this you know, American bull in a china shop in Spain, but maybe that character has a deep affinity to flamenco music and so therefore they have sort of a capacity to be in conversation with parts of Spain that they wouldn't normally have been in part in, in conversation with and then there are other moments where they're just like yeah no I'm just an American in Spain I don't know what's going on right now you know and that that kind of like push and pull of like not everything has to be connected about a character to their race not everything about a character has to be connected to their gender of course much of it will be but um but not all of it um, yeah i mean absolutely uh, but, but i mean i mean well, um, a, a few things to add over there i mean um the the the, the business of sort of 
providing uh, that kind of information and making it a sort of starting point or a parameter uh, it precedes identity politics. It, it's part of the realist novel, you know, um, uh, to, 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 to talk about a person's, you know, identity or, or cultural background or class or whatever. And th those things can be explored in very interesting ways. Um, but... Um, uh, and uh, um, when we come towards not just identity identity politics, but just the, the just the kind of intoxication of these categories, I mean, uh, the, the, the 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 whole idea of being an American or being an Indian mm -hmm. are particularly intoxicating and blurred and and uh, to, after a certain point useless mm -hmm. uh, uh, forms of intoxication, you know. So so you know. Um, mainly because they leave out so much for from who we are as Indians or Americans. Mm -hmm. Uh, they they leave out a great deal, you know. So so um, that oh, it's what they leave out that I not find interesting. Not just because that's left out, but because uh, there's a lot going over there that I need to explore in terms of that encounter, mm -hmm. which has formed us as Indians, as Germans, as Europeans, um, but not in the way we use those words over here. That's what I what I want to do. Oh, the way we use words. I'm sure you guys have lots more questions for Amit about all of that. Um, I uh, do want to make sure that we all are able to grab some lunch. And so uh, we will thank Amit and wrap up here. But if you guys have more questions for him, he will be sort of milling around a little bit. So make sure to come say hi and maybe buy a book in the back and get your book signed by Amit uh, while he's here. Thank you guys so much. And thank you to Amit thank for being here. Thank Thanks, you very much. Thanks, Piali. Thank you.